chilly observing floor of the 107 inch, the 2.7 meter Harlan Smith reflector you see here right above me. Now, as you look at the external tube of this big telescope, let me use the model that I have here in my hand to illustrate for you kind of how it works if you're, for some reason, unfamiliar with that process. First of all, the tube here above me measures from front end, where you see that big cage of pipes up there at the top end, to the back end here right above me is 32 feet long. The tube physically is 12 feet in diameter. It's open at the front end, like my model here on my shoulder, way up there where that cage of pipes is located at. The light entering up there is going to travel down this tube, and right here above me at the back end of the telescope, that is where we will find that 107 inch diameter or 2.7 meter diameter telescope mirror. Now, unlike my model mirror, which is small, flat, and quite dirty, the mirror here above me is 12 and a half inches thick. It's made out of corning uh, fused silica glass, and it weighs some 7,800 pounds by itself. So I think I'm a little happier using this mirror here in my hand. But unlike my mirror in my hand, which is flat, the front surface of the mirror here above me has been ground and polished. So it has a concave, kind of a magnifying makeup mirror surface that we call a hyperbolic curve. Now that smooth polished glass is reflective. Oh, sorry is reflective, but it's not reflective enough by itself. So to make it reflective, we coat the front surface, not the back side like your bathroom mirrors are. We coat the front side with a very thin layer of pure aluminum. I'm going to talk about that process here in a few more minutes. But that shiny aluminum surface, when starlight strikes it, reflects off that curved surface, and then the light rays are converging up the telescope tube and would come to a single precise focus if we allow the tube three feet top dead center above the end of that tube up there is what we have called the prime focus now we don't use the prime focus position with this telescope instead we modify it by installing ta -da, a second mirror at the top of the tube known as the secondary mirror, we actually have three different secondary mirrors that we can place at that location. Two of them are currently up there in that cage that we call a flip cage. It allows us to take and basically revolve it around and look at the other side where we have a different mirror that we can use. So with three different potential secondary mirrors uh, available for use, we have three locations where instruments are placed for actually observing the sky. So astronomers are not looking through an eyepiece like you see here on this uh, little refractor here on the side of the telescope. That was used years ago as a spotting scope when sometimes the computers would fail. We needed to resynchronize it on the sky with a bright star. But uh, today that, that little refractor up there, that six inch refractor, is basically more or less uh, just a counterweight at this point in time. But uh, so instead of looking through the telescope, light is delivered into some form of electronic instrument that serves as the eyes for the astronomers. So we have three locations where that light can be collected and analyzed. And we call those three focal locations the Cassegrain focus, the broken Cassegrain focus, and finally the Coude focus. Now, two of these focal locations are right here above me. Let me discuss them first. You might notice here at the back end of the telescope, directly above my head, there's a black and blue instrument bolted onto the back of the telescope here, looking through what we call the Cassegrain uh, uh, perforation. The Cassegrain focus is here at the back end of the telescope, and depending upon which instrument, we have two different mirrors that will allow for light to focus at this particular location. One mirror gives us a very low magnification, very wide field of view. Another mirror gives us kind of a moderate magnification, a moderate field of view. But we're not using this instrument here above me today, we call DIAFI. Uh, DIAFI is an acronym that stands for the Digital Imaging Auxiliary Functions Instrument. 
So diet is easier to say. But anyway, this uh, this camera that we have here on the back of the telescope is uh, is is not scheduled for service right now. So we just have kind of the uh, we just have the communication cables and stuff like that. It's kind of round up with some uh, some tape to hold them in place. So uh, anyway, so we're not using the Cassegrain position or diaphy at this point. But you'll probably notice that uh, there are actually portholes at 90 degree intervals around the margin of the telescope. Two of these are pretty easy to see. One of them actually has been, uh, has been uh, changed in its uh, function. So we have here above me this big uh, kind of galvanized uh, sheet metal box that we have there. And so we have an air filter in, in this box. And what it does is when the air conditioner is turned on, and it will turn on at the end of my tour here, uh, it's actually pulling this cool air that we have in the room through that air filter. So the enclosed space where the mirror is at here above me uh, is actually receiving uh, basically clean filtered air. So the mirror is not getting dirty with that air circulating around it, and the air is exhausted out of these kind of uh, October light devices, those are exhaust fans placed radially around the, the mirror periphery. So uh, by turning on those fans, it pulls this cool air in here, and it's cooler in here right now than it is outside because we keep our building air conditioned so that the temperature in this room is kept at early evening air temperatures. So if it's warm in this room, but it's much colder outside, and we open the roof of the building to see the sky, what's gonna happen to all that hot air? Well, oh. it's gonna rush out of the building because this lighter is buoyant. And uh, that hot air leaving the dome and the mirror being hotter than the surrounding outside air, that's gonna create thermal turbulence and heat waves on the mirror. And so until, those, uh, until the mirror and the objects in the room reaches outside air temperature, we're gonna get some pretty poor views of the night sky. So we want the best views possible, so we're constantly adjusting the amount of air conditioning in this room throughout the course of the year. So in the summer months, it's really nice up here. In the winter months, they can be a different matter. Uh, I've actually done tours on this floor when it was barely 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, on those Donner Party tours, only a few have survived. <laughs> So if you remember your history, good for you. All right, so anyway, but uh, over here on the side of the telescope, kind of come over this way a little bit, you can see that there is a porthole that has a shiny metal cover here on the side of the telescope. And uh, that's one of the positions that we actually use when we're using the broken Cassegrain, or what we call the Nazmuth focus. Now, how do you think we get starlight out of this porthole here? How do we deliver it out of the side of the telescope? By what method? Yeah, another mirror, okay. So the, the primary mirror here at the bottom of the telescope is concave in shape. The secondary mirror at the top is convex in shape. It bows out towards the primary. But then all the other mirrors that we use after that point are flat mirrors. So inside this tube there, we have a third flat mirror. Uh, uh, another word for third is tertiary. So we have our tertiary flat. And so by taking that flat mirror and putting it into the light path in there, tilting it at a 45 degree angle, we can basically turn that mirror around to send starlight out of one of these potential three external openings. But in reality, we only use uh, this one uh, here today. But obviously you see no instrument there, so we're not using that position. So we've eliminated the cast grain and now the broken cast grain. So that means number three is the coude focus. Now, the coude spectrograph is in a room directly below your feet on the fourth floor of the building. In fact, it takes off almost all of the fourth floor of this building. So to get starlight from our telescope here on the fifth floor down to the fourth floor, we need to employ a couple of more mirrors. But to show you how that light path is established, let me move the telescope for you so you can actually uh, see how it operates, but also reveal that light path that we have to use to get the light down to the room below your feet. Okay, so first of all, 
telescopes, when, when we're looking at the night sky, we're magnifying objects out there in space. But we're also magnifying the effects of the Earth's rotation on its axis. As the Earth is turning from west behind me to east behind you, as the Earth is turning under the sky, well, it makes the sky appear to move. So we need to remove the effects of the Earth's rotation. And that is done by attaching this 80-ton telescope to an axle here behind me that's held up by two unequally tall concrete piers that we call the South Pier. That's the black one over here behind me. And then over here to your right, you see that big tall structure in black? That's the North Pier. Now that axle that the telescope is attached to, called the polar axle, is pointed exactly north and south. But it's also tilted exactly at a 30 degree, 40 minute angle. 30 degrees and 40 minutes happens to be our latitude north of the equator. So by using about a half horsepower, maybe three quarter horsepower motor to move this big telescope, we can move it north and south and east and west and position it on the sky where we want to. So let me move the telescope first to the north so you can see a change in celestial latitude, which is something astronomers call declination. Let me get my little hand paddle here and uh, turn on the joystick. There we go. Okay, look at the front end of the telescope. You're going to notice it getting higher at the back end of the telescope. Oh, sorry. It's going wrong. <laughs> you think I know by now, but you know, I, sometimes the fingers want to do something different than the mind wants to do. Okay, so front end of the telescope is now actually heading upwards, not downwards. Yeah, I do know up from down, but sometimes standing on my head, I just can't tell the difference. Okay, so up we go into the sky, there, changing a celestial latitude, this declination. So you see that motion right there. Okay, now let's move the telescope to the west, which is behind me. Trust me, I know that's west. Okay, so up we go. So at the top of the North Pier, a small motor up there is lifting this 80-ton telescope, while at the same time, the 80-ton counterweight on the other side here, perfectly balancing the telescope, makes it very, very easy to move it in celestial latitude, which astronomers call that right ascension. Right ascension, they call that. So we see a telescope moving away from me. You might be wondering about this power cord. You know, when this telescope was placed in the service back in the 1960s, the electrical uh, demands on the telescope were quite small. We didn't have all those electronics way back in the old days. But uh, the ability to deliver electricity through slip rings from the polar axle to the telescope to power everything is now, our equipment has exceeded the ability of the slip rings to supply that needed power. So thanks to the folks at Lowe's or someone like that, we have now solved our problems. Yeah, so thanks for a great conversation piece is what it does. But anyway, so I moved the telescope away from you so you can now see the polar axle here behind me. So this axle is hollow. It's wider at the midpoint because we have a fourth mirror inside that axle. So turning that tertiary flat around and sending starlight into the polar axle, it strikes that flat mirror right in here and sends that light down to that hollow axle shaft, goes through the nice, warm, comfortable control room where the astronomers do their work at nighttime, and goes all the way down to the fourth floor where it strikes a fifth mirror and then goes into this optical in bench room here below us we call the Kune Spectra Reps. So that's the instrument astronomers are using today. And by the way, even though this Spectra Wrap here below us was built back in the 1960s, it actually remains at this time the highest resolution Spectra Wrap ever built in the world. Mm -hmm. So naturally, astronomers from all over the world come out here specifically to use the instrument here below your feet. Just a very, very popular one there. Okay, so uh, let me ask you a question here real quick. Uh, what is the telescope physically looking at right now? What's right in front of the telescope too? Four feet tall or so. And uh, that, that 76 foot diameter dome weighs about 220 tons. It, it has a railroad track underneath that, that uh, tan ring line there. 
And then behind these little uh, white rectangular boxes, we have what amounts to railroad car wheels, okay, more or less. And these wheels are supporting the weight of the delt. Now, two 18 horsepower motors, one over there behind the air conditioner stack, the other one over here behind me where the elevator is at. Uh, I'm going to turn those on now and turn the roof of the building. So as the dome begins to turn, you might feel like you're moving, but it's actually the roof that's turning, not you. So if this gets you a little bit uh, crazy, just put down your feet and look up. Yeah. So I'm going to go about a quarter of a turn around and hit the opening and go to the bell Okay, so the dark doors that you see over there in front of the telescope, those are the uh, shutter doors. If it were nighttime, I could open them up. But uh, guess what? It's not nighttime, and I'm not allowed to open those up. Get there. Mainly because I like my job. And it's really not a job anymore. Anyway. Okay, I'll let it go to a stop there. All right. So that opening starts here with the base where those white curtains at. It goes up to the top of the building, just behind those white curtains here. It doesn't go all the way over to the far end, but it goes a little bit, a little bit past the end over our head. So those two 10-foot wide doors slide apart, kind of like an elevator door does. And uh, then we can look out through that opening where the telescope is pointing out. So the telescope is computer controlled. Wherever the astronomer commands the telescope through the computer system to point to, uh, kind of like Mary had a little lamb, the dome automatically follows, okay? So, so everything is basically kind of computer oriented and tied together these days. All right, so the telescope is basically pointing at the opening here. So if it were nighttime, yeah, the astronomers would have the doors open, they would be observing, okay? But of course, we do have to perform maintenance on our telescope. And uh, uh, every week, we're actually getting in our tube uh, here above us and we're cleaning down the mirrors. Now, we don't use Windex and paper towels because the aluminum coating on the mirrors doesn't like having that kind of stuff on them. It actually degrade the mirror. So we sprayed them down with, get this, dry ice snow. Carbon dioxide snow delivered to the mirror surface ricochets off the mirror and it flicks the, 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 the dust off the mirror. If it sticks to the mirror, one thing nice about dry ice, it's dry. It sublimates. It goes from a solid to a gas, no liquid state in between. So it's trick free shine every time. Yeah. But, uh, but that dry ice uh, snow will only clean so well. There's some particulates that get stuck to the mirror that just won't come off. And after about two years, we're starting to see some degradation in the reflectance off of the mirrors. So we take this big telescope here above me, we'll roll it over and point it to the red and gray boxes there on the east wall. We'll pin the telescope with big metal pins uh, to the middle part of the floor here behind me. And then behind that big white curtain, let me lift that up here for you. I'm gonna show you what's behind the curtain. And it's not a new car in this case. <laughs> So by turning the roof, we can place that crane over any interior part of the building that needs uh, the crane's access to it. So
So about once every two years, we're going to take that crane and we're going to dismantle the telescope here, which is pinned to the floor. And we'll take the mirrors out. We'll lower them through the bay doors over here on the other side of the room behind me. Take those mirrors down to the third floor where we have our stripping and recoding facilities. We're not just going to add a brand new layer of aluminum to the old aluminum because after time it's going to build up unevenly and that's going to affect the image quality. So we strip off the old coating first. We uh, spray down the mirror with uh, acid that eats away the aluminum coating. Then we clean up that mirror very, very carefully and install the mirror into a 12 foot diameter steel vacuum chamber. Now, once that mirror is installed into the chamber, we install about 50 aluminum coated wire filaments that, uh, that have pure aluminum uh, staples on them. We pass electrical currents through those wires in that vacuum chamber with all the air pulled out. And in about 30 seconds time, the aluminum as it's vaporized in that chamber coats the surface of, of the mirror with a thin layer of aluminum, very even, that's about, uh, about, a, about a thousand eighths from thick. It's about a hundredth the thickness of the human hair, okay? So once that mirror has been coated, we put air back in the chamber, open the chamber up, inspect the mirror. If it passes, we're good to go. If it fails, usually failure is indicated by putting tape onto the mirror, waiting for a few minutes, then pulling that tape off. If we see any aluminum on that tape, we know that it didn't adhere to the mirror surface uh, well enough, so we have to strip and recode it. But normally it works the first time, so we don't have to go with that initial <coughs> second follow-up in there. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Saltooth Mountain. Second largest telescope in the world. George T. Abel. and expansion of McDonald Observatory by building a 300 inch fully steerable telescope that they were going to call the Eye of Texas. <laughs> but during the economic downturn of the early 1980s, they found it impossible to raise the enormous amounts of money to get that telescope off the, off the drawing board and onto the ground. So they basically uh, shelved the project and gave up on it. But within just a couple of years, of the University of Texas's failure to raise funds for their 300-inch telescope project, astronomers at Pennsylvania State University, led by Dr. Dan Weedman, who we see in the video here behind me, and his colleague, co-worker, uh, Dr. Larry Ramsey, they began designing a 300-inch telescope for their university's astronomy program. But realizing that a fully steerable telescope like the 107 would be an enormously expensive project, they decided to take a different pathway to reduce the cost of the telescope. And what they did is they took the design of the telescope you see here next in the video, the Arecibo radio telescope over in Puerto Rico. And so let me just pause this here right now. So the Arecibo radio telescope features a 1,000 foot diameter radio telescope dish, and that dish is permanently uh, fixed at a, a 90 degree angle. In other, in other words, it's pointing straight up in the sky at all times. We call this a fixed altitude telescope. 
So uh, Penn State decided that this would be a really neat design for an optical telescope, but you might say, all right, well, how in the world can you observe the sky when your telescope is permanently tilted? Well, the thing is, is that above the Arecibo radio telescope, suspended by cables, you have a tracking platform. And let me put this back into motion here so you can see how it works. The receiver, which is this bell-shaped housing, is moving along this uh, kind of banana-shaped rail, following the reflections in the dish below. By turning the azimuth, or the compass direction, of that rail, they can look to actually different parts of the sky. So, so the telescope can actually see probably a 60, 65, maybe 70 percent of the entire sky, even though it's permanently tilted. So not a bad deal when you get down to it. So Penn State astronomers, uh, we've been in Ramsey, uh, began designing this, uh, this telescope that they were going to use for large-scale spectroscopic survey projects. So they were going to call their telescope the Penn State Spectroscopic Survey Telescope, the PSSST, or PSST, as I like to call it. <laughs> Problem was, Penn State didn't have any time <coughs> to put their telescope on. So they went observatory shopping and discovered that the University of Texas had failed in this bid to procure funds for their 300 inch version. And so we became very interested in the Penn State project. So we joined forces with them. They took their name off the title, shortening it to the Spectroscopic Survey Telescope, or SST. But then, two private families, the Hobby family of Texas and the Everly family of Pennsylvania, they began raising millions of dollars to support these two universities' interest in the construction of this telescope. In fact, they raised so much more money than we thought that they could, we just uh, basically put that extra cash into expanding the telescope's mirror size from 300 inches or uh, 8 meters uh, basically to its current day dimension of 11 meters or 432 inches. So this mirror that will, well we may not see it in the dome, they, they, they have the telescope turned around right now, but, but anyway, the mirror that you see here spans 11 meters, 432 inches, or if you like, 36 feet in diameter. And of all the telescopes in the world today, that telescope mirror out there in that room uh, is actually, physically, the largest telescope mirror of any telescope mirror in existence today, north of the, north of the equator. Now, I say it that way carefully because a few years after we completed this telescope, uh, folks down in South Africa purchased the plans from us and uh, they built a carbon copy of our telescope down in South Africa. So it's called the South African Large Telescope, or simply SALT. But, uh, but anyway, if you've seen one, you've seen them all, pretty much. But the mirror surface, while it's 11 meters in diameter, we can actually only see or use at maximum 10 meters of the surface, which is 394 inches. So this telescope is twin in South Africa, and then two telescopes in Hawaii, Keck 1 and Keck 2, those four telescopes all have a maximum light gathering surface of 10 meters. And that gives them second place in the world because over in the Canary Islands, there is the Grand Canary Telescope and its mirror surface is 10.4 meters or 409 inches in diameter. So anyway, we won't see those telescopes on our tour today, by the way. So the Hobby Airway Telescope has this enormous mirror that spans 36 feet in diameter. But realize this, the largest single piece mirrors that you can, that you can have uh, fabricated for your telescopes today are no larger than 330 inches or 8.4 meters in diameter. So anything larger than that, like the Hobby Airway Telescope, whose mirror is over 100 inches larger than that maximum dimension, well, we have to take smaller mirrors and tile them together to form this much larger optical surface. So in the case of the Hobby Airway Telescope, we take 91 mirrors, just like the one that you see here on display. Each mirror measures from flat to flat, one meter or 40 inches across. Each mirror is made out of a high-tech type of glass uh, called Zero Deer, made by Schott Glassworks over in Germany. And this material does not expand or contract basically at all with changes in temperature. We say it's thermally neutral. So it's a very 
expensive material, but it's very highly prized in telescopes because of that non-expansive property for it. Now to hold that mirror up in place was 90, was, uh, 90 other neighbors around it. Uh, we have a turquoise network of steel pipes behind that called the mirror truss to hold the mirrors in place. Problem is with ordinary steel, it expands and contracts with changes in temperature. Thus the mirrors on top get pushed or pulled out of alignment. So behind each mirror and above the turquoise truss, there is a mechanical stage with three hinged levered arms driven by electric stepper motors. That stage is made out of a super high, uh, high tech type of steel, a very expensive type of steel called Invar. Like Zero Dur, it does not expand or contract at all with changes in temperature. So these three electric motors allow the mirrors the ability to tip up and down, to tilt back and forth, or piston in and out. So the first thing we do each and every night before we start looking at the sky is stacking and realigning all these mirrors so they work as one mirror. So like you see here when, in the steel, steel video right now, the telescope is pointing at this big black and white tower outside of the building. That's an optical alignment tower. It's called the Center of Curvature Alignment System or simply CCAS. So it sends out 91 radiating rays of light, basically one per mirror. The rays of light strike the mirror, go back into the tower, and then computers spend the next 20 to 40 minutes on average stacking and realigning the mirrors. Once they've been stacked, once they've been realigned, they communicate with each other across the gap between each mirror, which averages about a centimeter or so in, in width, and they hold that, they, they hold that position. If, they, if a mirror starts to move out of position, it sends uh, information to its neighbors, which is then a computer, com, uh, basically uh, sent to the computers, and they realign the mirrors automatically. So it's all done basically with computers. Now, the light that is gathered off of this enormous uh, mirror surface in there focuses up at the top of the telescope. We've got a big black ladder-like structure, it's called the tracker, and it, it pans left and right across the top of the telescope, and sitting up between the tracking rails is the receiver, you might say. It's called the Prime Focus Instrument Package, or PFIP, and light that goes into this, uh, into this receiver up there is then corrected to give it 20-20 eyesight because with a spherical mirror it has poor eyesight to begin with, but we give it, uh, we give it kind of a pair of glasses, you might say, and give it back 20-20 eyesight. And then we send the light out through fiber optic cables into spectrographs. We have three spectrographs that we're currently using. We have a low resolution spectrograph that resides at the top of the telescope. We have uh, a, a series of fiber optic cables only 35,000 of them that are directed into an enormous box that uh, contains what we call the virus spectrograph. Now virus in this case is not contagious, it's the visible integral field replicable unit spectrograph. Say that five times, okay? And this spectrograph was built for us by our good friends and colleagues at Texas A&M. Yes, we work very closely with our colleagues at Texas A&M. Sports is a different matter, but everything else, we're, uh, we're collegiate with them, of course. But, uh, but anyway, uh, the largest spectrograph in the world resides on this telescope called the virus spectrograph. And we're going to see it basically as big black boxes on either side of the telescope mirror. We may only see one of them because I think they've got the telescope turned around facing this big white tower out there right now. So when this telescope went into service back in uh, 19, uh, it was dedicated in November of 1997. I was hired this month back in 1998, so I've been here at the end of the month, 26 years. But regardless of that, uh, when this telescope went into service, uh, not only were the University of Texas and Penn State uh, basically operating it, two German universities, Georg August and Ludwig Maximilians, were also funding the day-to-day -day operations of the telescope in exchange for observation time given to them. So those four universities and two private families, Hobby and, uh, and Eberle's, uh, those, those two families, Hobby and Eberle, uh, raised the $13.5 million necessary to get this telescope operational and on the sky. But in 1998, astronomers discovered that the universe appears to be 
accelerating in its rate of expansion. We didn't know that until, until 1998. So we decided since this telescope is designed to do studies of motion properties through spectroscopic analysis, what we call radio velocity studies, uh, we decided that we would uh, build a project whereby we would use this telescope to study one million galaxies, million with an M, uh, one million galaxies in the span of just 100 nights of observation. Now you do the math, that's like 10,000 galaxy observations every night. So the original field of view, which was only like about four arc minutes or about a seventh of the diameter of a full moon on the sky, it would take us probably a million years to do that million galaxies uh, over, over uh, the whatever time span. So we needed to do a big upgrade. So we took the original tracker off and uh, redesigned it, made it kind of the six million dollar man thing, you know, the, the bigger, better, faster, all that kind of stuff. And we expanded our field of view to 22 arc minutes, which physically is about 70% uh, of the diameter of a full moon. So that new big corrector up on the top and the ability to see much more of our mirror as we had before, uh, we, uh, we and our colleagues at Texas A&M building that virus spectrogram there started doing in 2017 this uh, project we call the Hobby Ever Telescope Dark Energy Experiment. So we began initially by surveying about a million galaxies up in the area that you call the Big Dipper, we call Ursa Major. But we also added another part of the sky opposite of the Big Dipper in the sky to see if there was any kind of uh, biases in looking one way versus looking another. So we added another million and a half galaxies to the project. And later on this year, uh, before the summer uh, starts, we will be ending this, this multi-year project. And all those universities out there on that circular placard in front of the building are involved in this at next project. So right now they're keeping their, uh, their lips pursed and they're not telling us what they have found or not found, but uh, dark energy still remains a mystery even at this point in time. But we think that with our extremely deep survey looking at galaxies that are anywhere from around roughly uh, about 9 billion to about uh, 11 billion light years away, looking at this super, uh, super distant and large survey. In fact, it's the largest survey ever undertaken in the history of the field of astronomy. We think that our team is going to answer that, that problem of what, what dark energy is. So if they answer it, they get the Nobel Prize. If they don't answer it, they're going to Dairy Queen. Yeah! <laughs> yeah. Big cones for everybody. No, I'm just kidding. So we'll find out here for too much longer what they get. All right. So with that extensive information introduction and in man and in hand, let's go over here to the window and see what we see. Come this way. doing some work inside of the telescope right now. And, uh, but before we kind of look up that way, let's start at kind of ground level. So looking through the window here at about eye level, you see there's a big gray concrete circular ring wall. That's the pier that the telescope sits on. The piers for telescopes isolate them <coughs> from, from uh, vibrations produced by wind hitting the building and shaking the building and things like this. So this gray concrete ring wall supports this 150 ton telescope here in front of us. Now right now they have the telescope unfortunately turned away from us as facing the direction of the uh, optical alignment top, which we can't see because they have the building uh, uh, dome closed right now. But, uh, but anyway, with the telescope facing away from us, we see this uh, interconnected network of large diameter I-beam steel painted in white there. And then above that,